So if you'd turn in your Bibles, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. We're going to um, probably cover Deuteronomy 24 and 25 this morning. If it's going too long, we'll stop at the end of, of 24. But uh, my intention is to cover both chapters, and uh, we'll just see how that goes. Um, in Deuteronomy 24 and 25, you're looking at more civil laws for Israel. Uh, there are various laws, and they kind of jump from one subject to another subject. And we're going to look at the principles that they give and look at the heart of God and, and how they would apply to us at different times. But here's what's really neat, that though we're just reading these ancient laws, which, you know, on the surface can seem boring, can seem um, removed from us and today and what we're doing in life, Jesus and the apostles quoted often from them. In chapter 24 and 25 of Deuteronomy, Jesus quoted from these passages often, and so did, so did the apostles. And I think that's just amazing. They knew and studied this text, and we should be aware of the text too. That way, when we do read the New Testament and read things where Jesus is, is speaking and he's referencing this, we'll have a better idea of what he's talking about of how to interpret what he's saying. So it would behoove us to, to understand these things and just to be aware of it and that it's there. So Deuteronomy is, is a book where Jesus quoted more from Deuteronomy than uh, what's referenced in the New Testament. Of course, there's many things he said, but what's, what we have referenced and written of what Jesus said, he quoted more from Deuteronomy than any other place in the scriptures. So... Uh, we'll just begin with verse 1, and we're going to be looking at uh, some civil laws specifically concerning marriage and divorce to start. So when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, uncleanness, note that, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, it's delivered, and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, who took her as his wife, then the former husband, who divorced her, the first one, right, must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. At first you're thinking, okay, this is just God allowing for divorce, and the, it's a very uh, patriarchal society or something else where the, the men have the rights and the women don't and these things. But what God is talking about, he's, he's really upholding and elevating marriage and the seriousness of marriage when we look at this. This is often quoted uh, in the New Testament, this section here, and it's a popular passage when um, those who are believers uh, are in marriages or in situations where divorce is occurring or has occurred. They often, uh, if they're going to study the word, will land somewhere back in Deuteronomy 24 in these scriptures. They will look at this. It's a, it's a uh, popular one for that because it's what's referenced when Jesus speaks about uh, marriage. And it, it, you've got divorce is obviously, it's allowed, but it's regulated and strictly regulated. It's not this thing of uh, if the man says, I divorce you three times, the woman's divorced and that's it. No, there needs to be a certificate. This is a government regulated uh, thing that happens. There's a marriage covenant and it couldn't be broken by someone just wanting out uh, you needed a certificate of divorce. There must be cause also for the divorce. Uh, even with cause, divorce wasn't to be seen as an easy way out. Uh, man couldn't just say those words, right? They, ha they had to go and be recognized legally, and the papers had to be served and so forth. And it, it was a very serious thing. And in in divorce in Hebrew, the word has in its root the meaning of cutting off, of hewing, which means sawing off, right? Uh, what you would do to timber or lumber. And here's something C.S. Lewis said, quote, Christians all regard divorce as something like cutting up a living body, as a kind of surgical operation. Some think that the operation is so violent that it cannot be done at all. Others admit that it is a desperate remedy in extreme cases. There are 
sorry, they are all agreed that it is more like having your legs cut off than it is like dissolving a business partnership or even a, uh, deserting a, a regiment. So if, you're, if you have a contract, I had a contract with the military and that was broken and that was cut off, you know, but divorce is something way much more than that or a business or partnership and the cutting off, which could be very serious. It's a very difficult thing if that might happen, but this is way more than that. That's what he's saying, okay? It's not just an arrangement. There was a, once a, a unity in spirit and that God had brought two together. Let not man separate. So it wasn't to be easy. It wasn't to be preferred. And there were only uh, allowed by certain grounds. There's two clauses in this text here that it says that if she finds no favor in his eyes, that's the first one, because he has found some uncleanness in her, that's the second clause. So we've got two clauses here that there is no favor in his eyes and second because there's some uncleanness in her. And it may sound broad, and some rabbis later define this as anything the husband doesn't like. And even burning the breakfast, some rabbis have, have taught that, and that's so far off from the heart of God and things. It may be convenient for these selfish men, but it uh, certainly wasn't God's heart. Jesus taught us the reality of what it means. In Matthew 19, verse 8 and 9, in Matthew 19, 9, Jesus said, Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So Jesus defines this. Okay, so if anyone knows the mind and heart of God, who's it going to be? Jesus. He is God, and he is going to teach the truths of God with 100% accuracy. So how are we going to define what is going on here about the laws concerning divorce? Well, Jesus in Matthew 19 spoke about it, okay? So he is, he's going to, he's the authoritative voice on these matters. We should all say amen to that. Jesus is the authoritative voice on the matters of marriage and divorce. Jesus interpreted uncleanness for us. That clause, uncleanness. His interpretation of uncleanness was sexual immorality. That's the idea behind uncleanness, sexual immorality. And uncleanness in itself even means the nakedness of a thing. That's what it literally means, the nakedness of a thing. That's what the word is, is inferring, and Jesus understood that, of course, and so he says, except for sexual immorality. And he's saying, and marries another, he commits adultery and so forth, if it's another reason and so forth. But um, it's not just adultery, it's, it's sexual immorality, which is a broader than adultery, by the way. If there is sexual immorality, the husband now has a right to, but she must also... Second clause or first clause of, you know, looking in the other order. Find no favor in his eyes. Find no favor in his eyes. So he could forgive her. He could have mercy. He could have grace. So he must have a hard heart and find uncleanness. Those are the two things. And, of course, Jesus also spoke about that in Matthew 19, 8. Without favor. That explains what he said here. Matthew 19, 8. Moses because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Because it's in a sin-cursed world with sinful humans, like, hey, he's permitting this because of the hardness of hearts. In the beginning, it wasn't so. This is not God's design. It's not the best. It's not God's will. If the wife didn't have a hard heart, would she be committing sexual morality? No. No. If the husband didn't have a hard heart, would he be divorcing his wife if she did commit sexual morality? No. Hardness of heart. That's the root of why it happened that there was a divorce. But, of course, why something else happened was, was sin. The issue is the hard heart to Jesus. And people say we, we fell out of love. No. I don't buy it. You know, someone grew a hard heart. You didn't fall out of love. You grew a hard heart. Your hard, the hard heart became bigger than love. Hardness, bitterness grew and was bigger than love. We got to watch our hearts. We got to keep our hearts with all diligence, the scripture says, right? Out of it flow 
spring those issues of life and the thoughts and the so forth. We've got to watch our hearts. If you've been harmed, if you've been hurt, watch your heart. Don't let bitterness poison you. Don't let it become a root inside of your heart. We're accountable for how we keep our hearts. We need to keep our hearts with all diligence. Other issues which could lead to divorce is abandonment. In 1 Corinthians 7, 15, Paul speaks about that, abandonment. But here we read it's quite limited and strict to sexual morality in Deuteronomy here, along with a a hard heart, of course. God never commands divorce, but he permits it. And why? Again, Moses permitted it because of a hard heart from the beginning. It was not so. So not his design. That should be clear. And the second part there says you, you cannot remarry the first spouse because marriage was to be taken very seriously, not casually. Look at our society today. So casual. People aren't even getting married. I bet you if, if someone could tell me the statistics of, you know, the civil marriage office or whatever, I bet, I bet it's decreased. It's got to have, right? Because it's not held as as valuable, as something that's, uh, that's honorable or good or whatever. It's just not part of society as much um, as we're leaving the Judeo-Christian roots and, and God's design here and just going toward paganism, immorality, and so forth. So, you know, divorce is, is permanent is what it's saying there. It's, it's a permanent severing. So verse 5, let's continue on. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. Uh, The wife longs to be with her husband, her new husband. And and he's like, I want to work. I want to do that. He's like, you know what? You you don't just take a year off. Yes, he'll need to farm or he'll need to go provide or fish or what he does. But it's saying, no, he, he doesn't have to go and be in service for the military or government for a year. He, he is basically take that time out and be together. It's really neat. In, in my marriage with Heather, we got a, just allowed that. We got married in San Diego, and for a year we went to Mississippi, and we didn't know anybody in Mississippi. You know, we're not from Mississippi. Well, we got to be there for this year of just sweet time together. It was just us. And it was great. You know, of course, we went to church and we met people and we were serving the Lord and we were doing stuff. But it was just time together away from uh, the busyness of life, away from so much uh, uh, just things that we might have had to do had we not been separated like that together. It's really beautiful. And, and God, isn't it amazing? He says, take that time. He, it's, it's just, I think, a wonderful thing where God says to do that that you don't expect much upon them and stuff, a year without distraction, because there needs to be a bonding. And and Colossians tells us, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. The bond of perfection is God's love. And so the unity where the two are becoming one and uh, not putting anything on the newlyweds plate that distracts them from becoming one together and taking that time out together. I think that's just beautiful. Now the laws leave marriage and turn toward other general laws. In verse 6, no man shall take the lower or the upper millstone in pledge, for he takes one's living in pledge. There's going to be a lot about pledges throughout this uh, text here. And it's collateral, you know, repayment for a loan. It'll talk about coats or cloaks, you know, blankets that you'd wear, uh, taking them for a pledge and returning them at night and stuff. In this text, we'll see that in a bit. But you can't take an upper or lower millstone. You need both, and they're going to grind that grain and down into flour and so forth. Uh, You can't take something that people need for their livelihood. How are they going to repay their loan if they can't work? You can't take someone's tools. You can't take the truck that they need. You can't repo these things. You can't do that. If someone needs those things to go and work, then they shouldn't be taken from them. How are they going to feed themselves, right? So God is saying here, you can't do that. He's looking out for those who are in a position where they are are in financial duress. And it was already given as a law. You couldn't charge interest to a fellow believer or, or uh, someone of, a fellow Israelite. You couldn't charge them interest on a loan, and you also couldn't take stuff that they needed to work with, right? Not 
to profit off the poverty of others. Verse 7 says, If a man is found kidnapping any of his brethren of the children of Israel and mistreats him or sells him, then that kidnapper shall die, and you shall put away the evil from among you. Okay? So God takes kidnapping seriously. A kidnapper should be put to death. That's how serious he takes it. That's pretty serious. You know, and I think that that would prevent kidnapping if, if you found kidnapping. And it's a big deal. Maybe you've heard some of the radio programs or the ministries that are springing up. I, I heard of one the other week of, in L.A., and they're working with the county in L.A. and other things where the, that people are trying to find uh, children. There was a, a situation in Seattle I heard about. Yeah, in the West, in North America, where they prey upon uh, young girls and boys through the Internet and through media. You've got to be careful out there. And, and then they're isolated, they're alone, and they make all these promises, and then they put them into the sex trade or into some sort of slavery. And why the kidnapping goes on is almost always going to be slavery. And um, God takes that very seriously. It's not okay. I mean, think about what you would do if, if you had a child and your child was kidnapped. Um, God takes it seriously and the punishment is death. So he says you're going to put away the evil. Put away the evil. So that you know, it, that punishment is a consequence, but it's also a deterrent. It's a strong deterrent in, in a society. So we're going to see laws where it's like, whoa, God. But you know what? Uh, our government thinks it's uh, very tolerant and it's very, uh, our government assumes that it's more compassionate and kind than God. It really does. Our government thinks that we are more compassionate than God is. Yes, but is our government just at all? in some of these matters that they pretend to be more compassionate than God in. You see, and so people with soft hearts start thinking God's an animal or God's, you know, masochistic. Or Look at this. This is horrible. Things like this. He, he commands death. Why can't we rehabilitate? Why can't we save both the child and the kidnapper, you know, and so forth? Well, uh, I, like the man said on Friday night that was speaking here, he gave that testimony of Jeffrey Dahmer, who was an absolute... Uh, it was sick what that man did in the 90s and so forth. But he repented. He received Jesus Christ, and he was forgiven, right? And he still took the death penalty, and he still deserved the death penalty, you know, and he understood that. And so, but is, is he with the Lord? Are we going to meet that man in heaven? Is he going to be new and righteous? Yes, right? God is so gracious and kind. He's gracious to me. I've murdered in my heart, Right? You know, but I haven't done it physically ever, and I know what I ever want to. But in the past, I've been angry where Jesus says, and it's, if you've done it in your heart, you know, it's there. It's, it's within you, that potential for such evil. And so God is so forgiving, and, and, and yet, look at that. He's just. He is just. Is our society more safe because of its so-called compassion and so forth? Our society's not more safe. No, it's not more just. It's not more safe. Of course, you could go to the other extreme, and you can go to a, a, a society in the world, say the Middle East, somewhere like that, where pretty much anything you do, you're, you're dead meat. You know, you know, you touch something, hand, goop, boom, gone, hands cut off, or whatever. And they're just their laws are so extreme and stuff like that. And you're like, see, there's no lawsuits in our society, yeah, because everybody's terrified of everything, right? It's like the fear is so overwhelming. So God has compassion and mercy. And his mercy does triumph over judgment, but he does have judgment. Don't forget. And there is uh, a society. I mean, uh, let's move on. Let's just move on. Verse 8. Take heed in an, ortho, uh, or, sorry, in an outbreak of leprosy that you carefully observe and do according to all that the priests, the Levites, shall teach you, just as I commanded them, so you shall be careful to do. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way when you came out of Egypt. So this is referring to a few events in the past and commandments in the past in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. And if you wanted to hear those messages, they're online on the website and going through that in detail. Dr. Lou Wing, who is also a pastor, he's a doctor of toxology, and he practiced that medicine for years, uh, decades. And, and he's just got incredible insight into Leviticus. And he mentions how these laws of leprosy are totally up to date. Totally up to date with, with what the current standard, standard should be in medicine. Okay, and so what happened to Miriam? Of course, she rebelled against the Lord, and then she was given, she was given leprosy by the Lord, and she had to be separated, quarantined from the camp. 
and then when it was removed, she could come back in to the camp. And so um, Miriam, you know, was brought back in. So he's just saying, hey, follow the laws. Follow these laws. You know, there was laws about mildew in the house and, and mold and other things like that. There were laws for the safety and health of the society. Verse 10, when you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to get his pledge. You've got to stand outside and wait. You can't barge in and take it from him, right? Verse 11, you shall stand outside and bring the man uh, to whom you lend. And, and, sorry, and the man to whom you lend shall bring the pledge out to you. Just dignity, respect, Right? honor of one another. That's what it's showing here. Um, Out to you, where are we here? Verse 12, and if the man is poor, you shall not keep his pledge overnight. You shall in any case return the pledge to him again when the sun goes down, that he may sleep in his own garment and bless you. And it shall be righteousness to you before the Lord your God. So how do we treat the poor? How do you treat if, if you've loaned money or something like that? And, and how is it that you're going to treat them? And, and New Testament are told, you know, it's better not to, to loan even. Just give, right, as believers. Just give. And, uh, and then you're not in that situation or what have you. But, um, yeah, there's no, there's no obviously, like, uh, debt collection agency and sharks or whatever it's called going on here in, in God's economy. Uh, verse 14, you shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is uh, in your land within your gates, resident uh, immigrants. Verse 15, you, each day you shall give him his wages and not let the sun go down on it, for he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and it be sin to you. So a labor is worthy of his wages. And they may, need that, they may need that money that night. They need to buy food for their family the next day. They need to pay rent. They need to, they're living month to month, basically, and, and that money needs to be given to them on time. And God's, you know, he's speaking about the dignity and, the, and also there needs to be personal accountability, but not oppressing at all, right? And James 5.4 uh, rebukes this strongly, warning the rich man not to oppress his workers in the book of James in the New Testament. So we should treat everyone, regardless of financial standing, with kindness and respect. You know, God doesn't, uh, he doesn't say, wow, that person's rich. I respect them more than the person that's poor. You know, again, the book of James, God rebukes that. You honor the rich man and not the poor man. You know, you, you use your eyes and judge with your eyes. But God looks upon the heart, Right? He looks upon the heart. He's not looking at the outward show of things. Not at all. God's looking at the heart. And so we should also look at the heart. And others' welfare should come always before our own profiting. We should not profit off uh, others' welfare when it's at stake at all. So verse 16, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin keeps mentioning sin, 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 the reality of sin. And, you know, personal accountability is huge. I think God just really hones it into personal accountability in this text. Not just this verse, but the whole uh, chapter and the se- and of 24 and 25 and beyond that, throughout the whole Bible. God wants us to take things uh, uh, that we've done, personal accountability. He holds us accountable for our actions for our choices, for our sin. He doesn't hold someone else accountable, and we love to blame it on others a lot of times. That's the first thing people do, right? Like, in self-defense. Like, oh, no. You know, it was the woman you gave me, Adam says. It was the serpent deceived me, Eve says, right? So that blame has been going on ever since the beginning, right? Parents aren't responsible for their children's sin. They're grown children who, who do things. The parent isn't responsible, it says here, and maybe that is a blessing for you to hear. If you've got a wayward child and, and you're like condemned over it all, well, guess what? You could have done a great job and they're accountable for their actions and where they're at. Conversely, if you've got a, a, a child who's like ready to go be, you know, on fire for Jesus and all these things, don't look at yourself as if, wow, you know, that was because of how well I did parenting and I put them in the right school and I educated them in this and I did this. You know what? 
is the grace of God and was their choice at the end of the day. Don't be proud about that. So don't be condemned on the one hand or proud on the other. Just, just pray and seek Jesus. Yes, train up a child in the way they should go. But uh, you know what? Ultimately, people are accountable for, for their own choices that they make, aren't they? And, uh, we, you know, if, if there's a situation where um, we want to blame it on someone else, we have to take accountability for our own sin. You know, people, again, love to blame it on someone else or something else. And you always hear this argument, you know, well, Adam sinned, and that sin has been passed down, and I was born with that nature of sin. It's Adam's fault. If Adam didn't do it, and I've heard this, this is logic. This is normal logic. My, my son has asked me that, that question, you know. Uh, you know what? The reality is, yes, we would. Yes, we would still sin. Uh, yes, if I was in Adam's shoes, I would, it would have been quicker, you know. That's all. <laughs> I, we, I wouldn't have waited as long, probably, you know. And you think, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Really, you wouldn't, you know. Maybe you don't know yourself so well. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is desperately wicked. It's, it's so evil. It's that root inside our hearts to deceive ourselves. And we tell us we're, we're better than we are quite often. And that's not to live in a condemned, you know, state. Not at all. It's just to be aware of the reality of ourselves and to be humble before God and say, God, I need you. I need a savior. You find so many people who are moralistic and who think that they've done well and they don't think that they're a sinner and stuff. Man, if they read the law, they'll find out fast they are. If they interpret uh, what Jesus talked about and the Beatitudes and so forth, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And who's responsible for that? Not Adam, not God. All are responsible for their sin. All are responsible for it. People say, well, God made me this way and then he condemns me for being this way. We make choices every day, don't we? We make choices and we're accountable for those choices that we make. We think things and we're accountable for the thoughts that we have. Yes, we are born with the nature of sin in our um, spirit and we're born in that state, but yet it, it's profound how we revel in it, how mankind is consumed by it, is driven by it, and, and pursues it. And even being born again and having God's spirit, we still struggle. Think about that. That just shows you the propensity towards it, the fight that is going on within us to pursue sin, right? You've been born again, and all of a sudden, you know, you just stop sinning forever. You're sinless. There was a doctrine out there called sinless perfectionism. Once you're born again, you, you, you're perfect, you don't sin, and then, and then you start going toward it or something. No, no. I don't, I don't believe that we're, I'm going to be perfect until I meet the Lord and I see him face to face and I'm transformed into his likeness there in that day. And, and I don't get super condemned or something like that over, over difficulties and so forth, but I, we need his spirit so badly to put away sins, to die to those sins, right? And I'm not, I'm not excusing it. In a believer's life, we need to pursue the Lord but a person, look at this, it says a person shall be put to death for his own sin. At the end of verse 16, a person shall be put to death for his own sin. God's not tricking humanity. He's not sadistic. He's not warped. People are put to death for their own sin. The wages of sin is death. And that's why, for one, I cannot, I cannot believe in an evolutionary model that says death was before sin. There was billions of years of bloodshed and death, and then man came onto the scene, and then man sinned. No, death is the result of sin, biblically. You can't put one before the other it undermines the gospel of Jesus Christ. It undermines the order of all things. Our last enemy that's going to be destroyed, death is cast into the lake of fire. It's, it's going to be utterly no more. There will be no more dying, no tears, no death. Death is the result of sin. That's why. And we look around the world, everybody is longing for medical intervention and help because our bodies are dying. And they're dying because of sin. It's the witness within everyone, and it affects everything in this creation. Yes, we've inherited it, but we are each responsible for our own sin. 
You know, we are self-conscious beings, and we are aware of sin. We're aware. I didn't know what to call it before I became a believer. I didn't know the word sin. I didn't know what to call it. It's not a bad word. It's a descriptive word of, of those choices that we make that are against God, whether transgression or whether it's iniquity, you know, where we have where we have gone against the Lord and his way. And his way is truth. His way is light. His way is life. His way is abundance. His way is great. His way is love. And we go contrary to the Lord. And that's sin. In short, we make those choices. We're accountable. And it's part of understanding the gospel. It's a person shall be put to death for their own sin. And closing in this topic here, it's foundation, it's fundamental understanding this. So that's why I harped on it a bit here. It's foundational understanding of why everything is the way it is. Why is the world in chaos? It's a three-letter word. It's so easy. Sin, right? Why is there death? Sin. Why is there bloodshed? Sin. Why, why is there harm and hate? Why is there anger? Why is there animosity? Why is there bitterness? Why is there any of these things? The answer is sin. So it's not wrong to talk. Jesus came to put to death sin on the cross. Wonderful, the Lord did this. You know, there's, there's unfulfillment in people's lives. There's a, it's a wrecked world that we're in. It's so broken. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer to this world, to our own personal needs and the trouble that we each face. It's affected everything, everything. And we're all accountable for it. And it's also part of understanding the gospel itself, that, that a person shall be put to death for his own sin, that we need to turn from self to Christ. We need to repent, it's called. It's a beautiful word because it means, it means to, to turn from and to turn towards. We're turning from our sin to Jesus. We're turning from our self-reliance and our pride, which is a root of sin. We're turning to Christ as Savior. And understanding that we're, we're responsible for our own sin is fundamental, I believe, to understanding the gospel and the need for repentance for turning away from self. People can repent without even knowing what the word means or being told you need to repent. A repentance can be in someone's life who's just in that place of turmoil and they're turning away from self and they want help. They hear about God's love and they, they react to God's love and they yield to God's love. That's repentance. It's just happening. And we've put a label on describing what it is and it's biblical that the word and all that, but saying and recognizing I'm a sinner, I'm, I'm a leper, and I'm unclean, and I need a savior. I have this disease of sin, and it precedes righteousness, turning to the Lord, understanding that. That's why I say it's fundamental to understanding the gospel. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's the first part of understanding the gospel. If people don't understand the need for God's intervention through the gospel of Jesus Christ, why would they even turn? So we don't go preach condemnation of sin. The, the, people's own conscience is there. We can tell people, yeah, and we can make them aware, absolutely, that you, you are sinful. Sometimes people need that. But... It's by faith. God grants forgiveness for sin, right? And so there's personal accountability for marriage trouble. That's what we were looking at there, the hardness of hearts. Personal accountability there. It's personal accountability for how we treat one another with finances and loans and stuff like that. It's personal accountability uh, for sin. It's such a strong verse, such a heavy theological verse too. Verse 16, fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor should children be put to death for their fathers. It's not someone else's fault. Let's hold accountability to our own self and get right with God ourselves. That's the best we can do anyway, right? I can't repent for anyone else on behalf of anyone else. I can't be baptized on someone else's behalf. I can't, I can't make anyone else soften their hearts. 
but one man I can, and that's me. And I got to get right with God. If you're not right with God, get right with God. That's, that's what it is, right? For his own sin. It's hard for people to swallow. It's about the hardest thing, which I believe is why many aren't believers in Christ, because pride has to be humbled. Verse 17 continues here with about treating others. Uh, you shall not pervert justice do the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. You can't even take a widow's garment as a pledge. You can take other's garments, but not a widow's. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. What a great word, redeemed. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. How are you going to treat others? How are you going to treat others? Are you going to be like that servant who was forgiven much? And then you go to other servants and then you demand their payment to you, those that owe you? Are you going to be like that? Jesus told that parable. And that servant who was forgiven much, by his, by his master, and then he went, and then he demanded of other servants, his last penny is going to get taken away, and he's going to be put in prison forever. He, his, his end is going to be worse than anyone's. That's what Jesus taught. In other words, you're going to ask for mercy for yourself, and you're not going to give it to other people. That's really messed up. We have been forgiven so much and see, that's it. When we're so aware of our personal sin and personal accountability, we become so aware of our, uh, the forgiveness that we need from Christ that we no longer become condemning people. We don't become naturally judgmental somehow as if we deserved forgiveness and mercy. We become full of grace, full of mercy, full of peacemaking, full of good fruits of righteousness. These are good fruits of righteousness, good fruits of his spirit. Christians ought to be the most merciful, forgiving people in the world. And Jesus taught that. Not only did he teach it, he lived it. The whole world's at enmity against him. And he dies for the rebellious world? Man, I, I tell you, we, we should let it impact us. And it's not going to impact us unless uh, we're humble. If we're proud, then the way we treat others, it's going to show up, Right? Because he says, the text here, think about it. Remember, verse 18, that you were a slave in Egypt. And the Lord God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this thing, to be merciful. So remember, now, no one here was a slave in Egypt, were you? We were slaves to sin. Sin was our taskmaster. Slaves to it. Slaves under it. And we were redeemed by the blood of Christ, by the act of great mercy, forgiveness, and love. And being redeemed by his great act of mercy, forgiveness, and love. Therefore, that transforms our heart. And we love him, yes, and others. Why? Because he first loved us. When you're under that place where it's a flow of God's grace, it's a flow of his forgiveness and mercy, and you get that, and you're like, wow, he forgave me and I was unclean. And then, man, it transforms the heart. Love flows back to God, and it flows out horizontally to fellow mankind. That's what happens. And the text, I love it. It always refers to that. You were a slave in Egypt. Don't forget that. Don't forget that you were saved by the grace of God. Ephesians 2.1, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. He made you alive. Verse 19 when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, uh, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. So you're not going to go back over, twice over your field. You know, get it all. No. Leave it. Amazing welfare program, really. First of all, it's left there for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow, 
for those who didn't have someone to provide for them. But they still needed to get up and go get it. There was still labor to be done. So it provided them an opportunity to get up and go do something. You know, sometimes I think the welfare system where it's like, okay, we'll just come and hand over you. Now, if someone's an invalid, that's one thing. That's totally different. But people that aren't, they need to work. They need to work with their hands, do something, right? And so here's a system that allowed for that, but there was dignity in it too. There wasn't, there wasn't a shame upon it or anything like that. This was to be the norm. I mean, we see this played out in the book of Ruth, right? With Boaz and, and Naomi and the gleaning in the field. And, and Boaz is like, oh, boy, leave a little more for her, right? Just purposely leave more. Is that ever in our hearts, to purposely leave more? First of all, we've got to get over that hump and just leave something, right? And then go beyond that and purposely leave more. Jesus says, I won't leave you orphans. Don't be afraid. I'm going to send my spirit. Better than, better than me standing next to you, I'm going to put my spirit, the spirit of Christ, in you. How much better, right? He gives abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we're just beggars, asking for anything. He doesn't give us a stone. He gives us abundance. He gives us so much. He fills a banqueting table before us of the fruits of his spirit, of all his goodness, of all his wonderful manna, and we need to partake of that and be so blessed. We get to dine at the king's table, and yet sometimes we behave like beggars. Anyway, that's sort of getting off topic there with this, but it's an example of treatment to others. Make room in your income for giving and helping others, it's one of the healthiest things we can do, I think. Not, don't let money rule you. Don't let it rule you. Have power over it. You know, uh, this, this was a neat way that God dealt with things, I think. And uh, it, was, it was neighbors taking care of neighbors, right? Okay, give to the system that makes lots of red tape, wastes tons of money, and then they give to people who aren't responsible to do anything or something. Like, that's our system, basically, in a nutshell. It's kind of crazy. And some th good things are going on or what have you. But uh, I, think, I think we get ripped off sometimes living in such a system because, you know, the church isn't living up to its calling in some ways. In some ways, it's because things are being done already or whatever, and then people get upset because, uh, oh, well, I'm already paying th through taxes and these things. Yeah, well, pay through taxes, fine. You know, but this was, this was not something where it was compulsory or something. You, you, you could do it out of your heart. And there was going to be people who, who wouldn't. I'm just going to beat this olive tree one more time. You know, bah, bah, bah. store up a little more, store up a little more. Miserly. Verse 19. Uh, we, just read, we just went through that. So chapter 25. I think we should wait. There's some things in it that are, uh, that are interesting, to say the least. Um, there's, there's some parts in chapter 25 where you're like, really? If you read ahead, you'll see that there's some, there's some words in there, some ideas in there. You're thinking, that's, that's crazy. It's really just a few topics in it, but, but we'll wait on that. And I think that God just would have us take personal responsibility, take personal accountability. Uh, LF, can you go get your dad for a closing song for us, please? And um, may, may you touch our hearts with the gospel this morning, just to realize that, but for the grace of God, there go I, right? His grace is so marvelous, so matchless. I'm a sinner redeemed, and I was unclean, and yet the Lord had mercy on, upon me in Jesus Christ. And I, these are just principles of God, Right? They're just principles of the Lord's heart. And that's what we want to get out of his word. We want to get principles of his heart, of, of how we deal with things. So don't let, you know, whatever's facing you and your circumstances become so big that we forget Jesus, that we forget who we are in Christ in the midst of the systems of this world and the needs that we have. God will not forsake you. He will not leave you. He, he, he will never see the righteous go begging for bread. He will provide for you. He will sustain you. He will uphold you. He wants to bless you. So if you can let things go out of your heart, 
and receive his forgiveness for where you've erred, where you've done wrong or whatever. And honestly, just ask for that, receive that, and ask him to make your heart super merciful and gracious. That's his heart, to transform us into his likeness. And we've got opportunities all around us to be merciful, to be gracious. You know, there's times all the time where it's like, well, they don't deserve it. Like, uh, yeah? Okay. They don't. What are you going to do? Well, I want to see them behave a little better, and then, you know? It's like, man, that's, that's not the way the Lord treats me, right? It's not the way he treats me. So, Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness and grace toward us. We thank you, Lord, that you look on us with such mercy. We thank you, Lord, that we are the scoundrels who ran. We are the scoundrels who just turned backs on you and that you looked upon us with such love that you sent your son down and that you became a man and you lived humbly in a barn so that we could one day be with you in a mansion, Lord, that you came so uh, in, a, in, in a, such a humble way, Lord, that you would show mercy, that you'd be a compassionate and faithful high priest mediating for us, that you understand needs you understand where there's hunger. You understand where there's hurt. Lord, your heart of being the one who's been abused and divorced and so forth, you reveal that through Hosea. You reveal that, Lord Jesus, if anyone's been maligned unjustly, it's, it's really, it's been you. And so you relate to those pains that we have and the hurts that we have, but then, Lord, you call us to not be proud in ourselves and and not to be deserving in attitude, and you call us to be givers. Lord, you call us to, to let go of the cares of this world and follow you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Do a work in our hearts. They're yours. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.